I've had wanted to fly and uh, and be in the Air Force for a long, long time. And as the time was, we were the war was in the offing, and everybody knew it. I think at that time, and after December seventh, then everybody wanted to get in, and so uh, we. Have, my, my, a buddy of mine and my, myself applied for the uh, um, aviation cadets and um, were accepted. They had a glut of pilot training, and so we were deflected off into bombardiers training and navigators training and, and gunnery training. Mm -hmm. And um, I, my eyesight was was I had astigmatism, and uh, so they said that that rendered me below the lineman of what they'd accept for pilot training. So they put me in gunnery training, <laughs> like boom, boom, you know, you shoot a gun, and uh, that seems a little uh, off base. But anyway, that that's what happened. Well, it was November sixteenth, uh, nineteen forty-two, and it was. Uh, in the winter, it was uh, cold, snowy. We, I went to uh, took a bus and went to um, uh, Fort Custer in Michigan, and um, it was just uh, getting issued clothing and l looking like a soldier, but we were anything but. <laughs> well, it was very military, and that's what we were there for. And uh, after I got over the fact that I wasn't in the aviation cadets. Uh, but I was in the Air, in the, uh, air Force, and I was going to make the most of gunnery training, and um, so I, I enjoyed it. I, you know, I liked the discipline and so forth. Rise and shine, boys! Up! <laughs> we uh, started out with caliber 30 machine guns and then uh, caliber 50 machine guns and um, after I got back from overseas um, I was a gunnery instructor on caliber 50s and there's a interesting thing that most people don't think about but the, the back travel of, of the machine gun when it's being fired is visible only about half of, of the it's way back you know it goes back and it's going so fast that your eye just doesn't see it back here and so one of the things that you're supposed to tell students, and I was at that time an instructor, uh, was to gauge this thing and, and for sure, carefully, not get down to where it would knock your teeth out. Mm -hmm. So I was so assiduous about this, and I was having my student teachers uh, watch me very closely and sh show how far I could get down, and so help me God, I broke my fr front teeth out. Mm -hmm. And there was blood coming down my chin and so forth, and I thought, that's it, I, I, I'm going to get washed out of this even. I mean, I'm, I'm a hell of a soldier. When the instructor, the supervisor of instructor's training came up, he saw me and broke out laughing, and he said that that is the best demonstration. Those students are never going to forget this. They, you've taught the lesson very well, pass. <laughs> and. Uh, so then we started started flying missions. I was a waist gunner, left waist gunner at the outset, and um, I I'm, still know some of the guys from that crew. But anyway, that that's what happened. One of the f main features, sociological features of of um, the combat crews, was the, the fa family bonding that they all experienced, almost all experienced, and. Um, they lived together, died together, as the song says, went down in flames together and so forth. The spray ball turret the, the, underneath the belly of the, the 17 and the B-24 uh, was removed from the B-24 because it wasn't worth what, the drag that it caused was not worth the, the additional firepower that it, that it gave. So that meant that in this tight group, of family type uh, guys, uh, all of a sudden a ten man crew became a nine man crew. Who's going to be the ninth man who doesn't go? 
and this is hard to understand, but I suppose for people who haven't been there, but the worst thing that could possibly happen is to get behind, get behind your crew, you know, to get li like they they all have ten missions and you have nine. Our um, very popular, friendly, lovable little guy, his name, his name was Kraus, as I recall, was removed because there was no um, uh, spray ball. Well, they were all the way from milk runs, which was the term that we used for um, going over and dropping our bombs just across the channel and then coming back with no flak or no fighters. Um, there weren't very many like that, but some there there were some. Uh, two horrendous air battles that went on and on and on and followed us, you know, halfway across Germany and across, clear across France and so forth. So it was. Um, the, the two problems we had were basically with fighters, German fighters, which were the FW-190 and the, and the uh, uh, ME-109, and, um, and, and um, 88 millimeter uh, flat guns that were fired at us from the ground. After about the first five missions, people began to really be concerned. At first it was sort of bravado, here I am, I mean, we're going to, you know, solve this war now, now that I'm here and so forth. Not quite, nobody would say that actually, but there was a little bit of that feeling of bravado. But after the fir first few empty bed syndromes occurred, you know, when guys had come back and, where are they? They're gone. <laughs> and maybe they show up in a day, maybe they not show up in a day, maybe they'd be, you know, shot down or something like that. So people began to think, hey, this is really serious. A guy could get hurt pretty bad in this business. So they, all kinds of little stories came up about uh, um, how you save yourself, how you don't get shot down, and so forth. And one of them was that you don't have to worry until you get hit with the, the bullet with your name on it. On my, after my fifth mission, I got a pass to London and took the train down and thinking about this all the way. And as soon as I got down, I jumped off and there was a little shop where you could buy almost anything. Uh, and at that time in London, you could buy almost anything. And um, so I, I uh, got this German aircraft, aircraft 20 millimeter cannon shell. And I didn't even wait to wait out the rest of my term over there. I got on the re return train back to Shipton, uh, my base, and um, went to, right to the paint shop and painted Tom Parsons on it. And as soon as the paint dried, I put it in my parachute bag and I carried it on all my missions after that, and it worked. Th there were a couple of missions that were horrendous. Uh, one of them was the most damaging that our squadron experienced in all of World War II. And the best account of that that I know of is what I wrote, a 19-year-old boy at that time, you know, get writing down his impressions of, of uh, aerial combat. There were about 400 parachutes in the air at any given time. Um, there were about 150 aircraft that were against us, f flying through us beautiful formation flying. Um, they were coming at us through the sun. And um, to, it's hard to recapture those, those feelings. And the best job I think anybody's ever done, frankly, is my little after-the-fact notes that I took at that time. Another, another mission was to uh, Keel. Um, and this is an unusual kind of thing, too. Uh, we were assigned to fly uh, Channel Hopper, I think, which was a plane that it had quite a few missions. And at the end of the runway, it became clear that Channel Hopper was not going to hop another channel. Mm -hmm. So we came back and um, with the intention, with the expectation that we'd abort. But because Kiel was such a high-value target, um, the pilot 
said, well, we, we better put this to a vote. Well, these guys who are, had this gung-ho attitude of, we, here we are, we're going to save the world, and we're going to, so forth, they all voted, yeah, let's go. And the pilot and I looked at each other and um, shook our heads in despair. We were way up, and there was a, the only sign of any other activity was off to our left. There was a, um, um, a group that had dropped its bombs and was ca catching quite a lot of flack. We weren't getting any flack particularly. It was just as though there were just one little air airplane. They had bigger fish to fry that were still in evidence. So I called the pilot up in, on the intercom and uh, said, drop it to the deck. Let's, let's drop it to the deck. So he did. So I salvoed the whole, the whole load of bombs. I think we had uh, six 500-pounders and a whole bunch of, of um, aimable clusters of pho phosphorus-type bombs, you know. And uh, so uh, the bombs sort of skip-bombed, actually, which was not a technique that was, had been very well worked out at that time. But they skip-bombed into two open su submarine pens the uh, seventh reconnaissance uh, group that, that that came in very early in the morning, the next morning that was uh, October 18th, uh, reported two um, submarine pens that were just completely destroyed and ruptured from the inside, and I like to think that was mine. <laughs> 492nd bomb group was the lead bomb group, or or no, it wasn't. It was um, I think our, the 44th bomb group was, and and this uh, pilot Marcoulier, whose last mission it was, I think, um, was the the um, um, the lead lead pilot of the whole mission, and. Um, I was in the nose turret, and the nose, the nose turret, of course, is at the, in the nose of the airplane, obviously, and it was ahead of the of the pilot's uh, uh, command deck. So technically, I was I led the Eighth Air Force on that mission. Um, still, that d didn't get me out of trouble because I got a, uh, a shard of flak, a good-sized chunk of flak, that uh, hit hit the guard, there was a guard that went up and down. If you tilt your guns down, this guard would go down and protect your lower body. And it was a steel, a chunk of steel about like that. And um, I got a, a good, that was the only damage we got. We, we got that thing and I, it, it made our uh, the turret inoperative, but it didn't make any difference as it turned out because there was nobody else we didn't run into any difficulty. But the 492nd did, and they were literally wiped out. And it was, to my knowledge, it was the only case in World War II where a whole bomb group was rendered inoperative. It never, the 492nd never flew again. Toughest day? Oh, without doubt, the Bernberg mission. Um, because we took greater losses, it was the toughest day for our whole squadron. We lost more men. Uh, I think that's the one where I said that in, in the, the um, uh, diary that uh, there are about, at any given time there are about 400 parachutes in the air all raining down at, at once. It was it was just incredible. Well, the the the, the uh, pilot ahead of us um, had trouble with this. This guy named Edmondson had trouble with his PDI, and he was coming into the bomb run, and so he called the, the deputy lead behind him to come in and, and take his place. And just as he was slipping out and the other guy was slipping in was when this first wave came through at us. And it was impossible to, to 
sh shoot him safely because shoot at him safely because uh, I would I, I would be as likely to hit the tail gunner of Edmondson's crew as I was to hit the German pilot. I remember literally seeing the, the rivets on the belly of the plane as he came through. While this was going on, um, the, the deputy lead slipped into the place that Edmondson had, was pulling out of, and um, he was hit at the root of his, his wing, uh, and the whole wing fell off. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, no one got out. And this was all happening. Uh, shards and things were hitting the, my turret, you know, parts parts of, of the plane. It was you c couldn't have gotten closer to the action. <laughs> and of course, when the when the uh, aircraft got down actually to me and and it was firing at me, and I could see the the little puffs of of uh, of um, exploding. Um, 20 millimeter cannon shells, like the one I had in my in my uh, par parachute bag. By that time, I, I got marshaled into action. I mean, I you know I knew what had to be done and and uh, and did get some good bursts in, but probably uh, shot down one of the guys. But there was no proving it, and so it, I never got credit for it. There was a big emptiness. <laughs> Uh, we went to a part of the base where uh, where people who uh, had no further use <laughs> were were put and uh, we were booked to leave the base and and uh, and we didn't fly back. We I think there was a what we were told at the time was we went on the on the liner Wakefield and. Um, and it's other passengers beside us. Well, there were about 12 combat men and uh, aerial combat men like uh, like ourselves, and um, a crew of Coast Guardmen whose first trip it was. And um, it, we had terrible weather, and we were cha chased by a submarine. We were told, and uh, we dro were dropping depth charges. And uh, it was a very turbulent return, and I thought, my God, is it possible that we'll, after going through a tour of combat missions, that we go down in this old clunker? This is hard to believe, but I remember thinking, at that time, we were beginning to think about what's going to happen to us after the war. I had heard rumors about the GI Bill being written up as legislation, the best thing since the Morrill Act uh, for higher education in America so forth, and so I was determined to get on that, if there, whatever there was of it. Um, I, I went to, I applied at uh, Northwestern, and um, and I'd been accepted, some kind of a tentative ex acceptance at uh, um, Kenyon College at Gambier. That was ill-fated because it was uh, uh, aeronautical engineering, and I'm, I've got about the sense of a flea when it comes to things like that, you know, so I'd never made it anyway. But I was accepted at Michigan and I jumped at that. Uh, well, I was just an undergrad at the beginning and, and uh, was interested mostly in the social sciences. And journalism uh, was the most applied thing that I got into and uh, finally wound up in social psychology and, uh, and education. I wound up, as uh, as I said, as associate dean for public services at Cal State University, and they didn't know what in the hell that was. We did some un unusual kinds of things. You see the evidence of it here. We got into Indian language programs, <laughs> and the reason for that was because they had the, one of the largest Indian language, indigenous Indian populations in the United States up there. Most people don't know that, and. Um, so it's, the outlook for Indians now in higher education is uh, totally transformed from what it was then. I, I uh, filed as a conscientious objector. Well, at that at that point, ha having been involved 
so directly in the blood and guts of the thing, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I thought nothing is worth this. Nothing is, is worth going through that. And that's never been challenged. Now most of my buddies went to Korea at, right after that, you know, and were called back. And I probably would have been too. I almost certainly would have been. They required a very stringent, detailed um, justification for doing this, for being exempted from the draft. I thought. I suppose mine was. I'd gone through. Nobody could doubt my mettle by that. By that time, as you. I mean, that was a feeling we had. You know, I can't help but say that I have a feeling of pervasive feeling of disappointment. Um, we thought we had won the, won the war, won the world, won peace for, forever, and you know, all that stuff. It's almost embarrassing to, to um, put it in those terms. But I, I suppose the, the best thing that people can do is to treasure what we've got in this country, the freedom that we have, be willing to fight for it, if, if necessary, uh, be very jealous of having our fighting ability drained off in areas that aren't relevant to our nation's welfare. Hint, hint. Um, yeah, I, I think I think we need to love each other more, love each other, our, love our country more, um, be less. Uh, selfish, I guess. Um, that's what I'd like to say. And if, if anything that can be said about our experience would influence someone to th say, hey, that's a good idea, you know, well, I, I suppose with dim hope that that'll be, be true.